nothing if not a stickler for tradition and this happens to be the seventh year that I have done a best books of the year video and I'm not about to stop the train now so welcome if you are looking to build your 2023 TBR list and you don't want any chaff you just want the juicy juicy wheat this is the video for you if you haven't been here before Hello, my name's Lena. I worked in book publishing for 10 years and I am now an author. I released my own poetry collection this year called Bargain Bin Rom-Com. But I haven't just been writing books, I've been reading them. 75 this year to be precise, which isn't my personal best. My personal best was 114, but we were in the middle of a global crisis and I was trying to self-medicate with words. So that benchmark aside, I think I've had a bloody great reading year. But there can only be 10 winners. I've whittled it down for you and here is my list. In no particular order but the first one I'm going to show you is Holly Jackson's Five Survive. Holly Jackson joins the <laughs> elite list of authors who have more than one book that I've read all of their work of, working on the title. And I couldn't let that title slip by not reading her new release. This came out in December and I got to interview Holly for a Waterstones event, so I did get to read it a little bit early. <laughs> Holly Jackson's A Good Girl's Guide to Murder series is genuinely one of those murder series that actually lives up to all of the hype, plus maybe a little bit. But this is a standalone book designed to break the most reprehensible, the thickest of reading slumps. It's written in real time, so it spans eight hours in which you join six characters on an RV road trip. They get lost, they break down in the woods. Apart from then, they realize they haven't broken down in the woods. A sniper has burst all the wheels in the RV. He's left a walkie-talkie in the RV and tells them that one of them has a secret that he needs and none of them can leave the RV until they work out what the secret is. I've seen many things in my time, but I have never opened a book that has the floor plan of an RV at the front of it. And for that alone, I can recommend Mend it. I thought it was really, really skillfully put off. All of the six characters are very well fleshed out and feel genuinely real, and the resolution is very, very satisfying. The world is feeling. <laughs> a little tepid right now and I think it's really really important to know what our rights are and understand even on just a civilian level the extent of the law and not be afraid to interact with it. So if you're thinking about protesting next year, if you're thinking about using the internet, if you're thinking about renting or are renting right now, this is the book that you need. The Law in 60 Seconds, A Pocket Guide to Your Rights by Christian Weaver. Christian Weaver is an incredible human rights lawyer. He's been in the news a lot for some pretty high profile cases. And I think this is an accessible and straightforward, but also engaging guide to your rights. It's designed to be a little handbook that you keep around for when you need it. I read it back to front because I'm a nerd. Obviously you're not going to be able to remember everything you read in this but it one is a great reference tool to have around and two I think it means that I'm less likely to be lied to either in a real situation because I have had some interactions with some policemen this year or if you're hearing something on the news when you hear something that doesn't align with something you've already read you're more likely to question it so even if you can't recall and repeat everything you learn I think it's a great balm against this very spiky law landscape that's going on at the moment obviously this is UK law if you have suggestions of similar books that are available in your country please leave them below but this is one of the first of its kind that I've seen that is this accessible and this good and for that reason it more than earns its place in the top 10. Look I was shallow, I'll, I'll level with you, I'm, I'm, I was incredibly shallow and I bought this book for the cover. All's well but it turns out the insides were as pretty as the outsides. This is an incredibly crafted concoction of eerie explorations of mental health, overdue representation of chronic illness and chronic pain, and poetic, spooky, meta Shakespeare? What? I know, it, it works, it works though. It follows Miranda who is a failed actress turned college drama director who is directing a production of All's Well's That Ends Well apart from all of the cast really want to do Macbeth so they keep accidentally slipping into Macbeth and trying to manipulate it so it turns into Macbeth and she at the same time is having this really surreal breakdown around her pain that nobody else really believes about her chronic illness. It plays with the idea of interpretation and spectre and it's just it's just such a clever book. I haven't come across an, a book this unusual in a long time and I felt very honoured to have read her work and I'm definitely going to read more of it. When We Were Birds is another eerie fiction novel, that's what I'd call it. It's part love story, part ghost story. It's set 
mainly in a graveyard in Trinidad over two different time frames. And it's about a man who leaves his family to become a grave digger, something that they disapprove of, and a woman who has these powers passed down to her from her ancestors where she can talk to the dead. It's very pacey, but also beautifully written. And I did tear up a little bit at the end and anything that makes my cold heart cry this year after so many books that didn't also deserves a place on the list. Now, if you're wondering who the other author is that joins Holly Jackson on the list of authors who have released more than one book, of which I have read all of them, it is Vari McFarlane. She released another book this year because she's spoiling us. Vari writes incredibly intelligent, genuinely funny rom-coms that all have different twists in them and I think they're all incredible. She's also coming out with one next year, Praise the Lord. Um, this one's about a wedding photographer who gets mixed up with a wedding that gets called off while her life is falling apart and she has just called off her own wedding. She's out of options on where to live and she moves in as a lodger to this guy, Cal's house. He has some secrets, she has some secrets, chaos ensues. 10 out of 10, Vari, you hit it again, keep hitting it, we'll keep buying it. The next one is a book I listened to in audio, it's Ed Winters or Earthling Ed as he is on YouTube's book, This Is Vegan Propaganda. Clever title and I genuinely think the execution was excellent. There's balance, there's research, it's readable, it's a one-stop shop for all of the questions you may have about veganism or the other people around you might have about veganism. Ed is one of the calmest, most tranquil debaters I have ever seen. And me and Melanie Murphy read this book together as part of my series, No Books in a Dead Planet. You can watch that up here if you're interested. But this is a book I'll genuinely be reading again because I want to keep absorbing not only the statistics, but the more holistic, moral aspects of veganism and what that means and why we have questions around it and what is a sentient being and if pigs are smarter than dogs how do we reconcile that with moral consistency. Melanie went into it thinking she would genuinely hate it and came out with her mind changed so keep an open mind when you're reading it and I think as far as thorough non-fiction books go it's easily probably the best one that I've read this year. I was looking for more books written in verse. If you have any that you genuinely recommend are no good can you please leave them below because I'd like to read more of them. This one is called Charlotte and it's a fictionalized account of a real woman who lived before and during World War II as a Jew in Germany. Charlotte was part of a long line of women who had been ending their own lives so it's partly about her living in the legacy of knowing that but also becoming an artist in her own right. It's about living under the stories of your parents and grandparents and great great grandparents and how that can be a burden as well as a gift. It's also about living through something you know is becoming a historical moment around you and you can't quite compute it so you turn to art. And reading this and then going and looking at some of Charlotte's real art that she made about the meaning of life, the point of staying alive, it's genuinely so moving and I will probably read this again in the future. A really unusual offering and if you haven't read a novel in verse this one is like really easy to read and really beautiful. Okay next one also an audiobook. Joyce Carol Oates writes blonde. Hot potato! Hot potato! So I read this book, um, I got it out of the library because I knew that the blonde film which is about the life of Marilyn Monroe was coming out and I thought oh maybe that would make an interesting video. I do have a lot of notes on the toxic nature of fame etc. And then I read this book and I was totally blown away. The way it is written is jaw-dropping. The way it's read in audio is all-consuming and beautiful and the person who reads it is transcendental. <laughs> as an audiobook reader. And I also thought it was really sensitive, really tastefully done, explored all the issues of feminism around her life, all of the secrets that could have been there. It is a fictionalized account of her life and the way that Joyce Carol Oates has described it in interviews. Um, she does an interview at the end of the book explaining why she wrote it and why she thinks a fictional account is more respectful than trying to like hash out everything that ever definitely happened to Marilyn Monroe. But she went around kind of essentializing. So if there were like four men that did similar things to her, she decided centralize them and put them into one man. Several miscarriages become one miscarriage, stuff like that. But I came away from that book being like, wow, there's fictionalized memoirs 
and then there's Blonde. And then I saw all the reviews for the Netflix film and it was really concerning and it sounded like they'd really perved on her as a fictional character and they kind of done it through this really, really weird lens and it didn't seem like what I'd read in the book and it sounded like it had been kind of stripped of its integrity and its artistic nuance. And I kind of just thought, I don't know if I want to watch that. I think that I have great memories of the book and that's fine. So if you have watched Blonde and you do think it's worth a watch for me, let me know below. But at the moment I'm sticking with this. <laughs> and I think that if um, exploring Marilyn Monroe's life and the themes that were portrayed in the trailer of Blonde sounded good to you, but then you heard the reviews and you were like, maybe not, then maybe you might like the audiobook. It's also nice and long, which I actually quite liked. Totally immersive and I think very respectfully done. I read two Alex E. Harrow books this year and it was hard to work out which I was gonna put in this list, but essentially the Once and Future Witches won, but The 10,000 Doors of January was such a close second. Um, I know that her writing is kind of Marmite for people. Some people don't like how poetic it is, or I don't know what they don't like about it, but I know that it's one that either divides people. People are either addicted to her writing or they don't like it. I am in the addicted category, and this one in particular captured my imagination when it came to themes. This is set in the 1890s in the US, and it's about three sisters, Juniper, Agnes and Beatrice who have all fallen out but all happen to live in the same city doing various different things. Their lives start intersecting with the suffragette movement but then they realise that a lot of the suffragette movement is kind of exclusionary of working class women like them and also women of colour who are people that they start to get to know and they break off and instead of giving up the idea of getting a vote at all they start encountering witchcraft in their own lives and setting up a secret coven of suffragette witches. <laughs> Look, when I'm explaining it, it sounds silly, but genuinely it's so freaking good. <laughs> so if you're looking for beautifully written sentences or intersectional historical feminism with a little bit of a queer love story on the side, if you're not ready to dip yourself fully into a tank of fantasy, but you would like some ethereal magic in your fiction, forget to pick this up at your peril. Sarah Moss wrote one of my favourite books of another year called The Ghost Wall and this year I challenged myself to read more books set in the place that I was born and now live, the Midlands. So when I heard that she had written a book about Coventry called The Tidal Zone, it was an obvious one that had to go straight to the top of my TBR and thank God it did. It's also got flaps of pictures of Coventry Cathedral windows which uh, is the place that I spent my gap year working, so <laughs> rock and roll. This follows a middle-aged man called Adam who is a lecturer and is writing a book about the history of Coventry Cathedral, which is quite dramatic. It's about the Blitz and it's a rebuilding thing. If you don't know about it, there's a history thing. I'll leave some history below. While he is writing that history of Coventry Cathedral, his 15-year-old, very outspoken, very activist daughter becomes very, very critically ill. So he faces this juxtaposition of writing about response to an incredible amount of loss and on the precipice of maybe experiencing an incredible amount of loss himself. It explores academia and sex and gender and not being able to read your way to the answers. It's about failing bodies, rewritten histories, messy parenting and being in relationships while both of you are in a lot of pain. It's about pushing through the day-to-day -day rituals while the bigger picture is potentially crumbling and it's a book that's like an incredibly quiet still book but also like unexpectedly powerful and like gut punching. So if you would like to join me in my long crusade to read more books set in Britain but not in London, I would highly recommend you picking this up. I'm gonna level with you even though 2022 did bring me these books. I don't feel like I had a great reading year in general. I had a resolution a few years ago to start reading more fiction because I was more like 50-50 in a fiction and non-fiction, but actually I really miss the non-fiction. And I also felt a lot of the time I was just reading what came into my lap. I wasn't going out and finding stuff that like I knew I would genuinely enjoy. So if I was going to summarise this reading year, I'd honestly say it's been a bit meh, even though I found some gems. I don't think I've found anything that's like a long-term favourite, you know, like a, a favourites of all times. I feel like I've had years where I've found like five books that have gone on my best books of all time. That being said, I 
have had a great rereading year this year. The rereads can't make it in my top 10, that's my rule. But notable rereads include Brand New Ancients, Wedding Toasts I'll Never Give, More Than a Woman, Once There Are Wolves, Resistance, and Why We Broke Up. I'll also leave links to where you can buy Bargain Bin Romcom worldwide if you would like something silly and accessible that was illustrated by me and has all my weird drawings in it. You'll find that below. I would love to know in the comments what you have loved this year. I don't want to like, I want a love. It's a very short life we have. I only want to read the corkers, so please tell me below what you have loved this year. If you would like my story graph stats, they will be coming out at the very end of the year. I'll probably put them in a short or something just so you can see, because obviously I'm still reading because it's still December. So if you haven't subscribed or you don't have your bell notifications on, make sure that you do so you don't miss that. This video has been made possible by The Gumption Club, who tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening. If if you would like to watch best books of the year from Christmas's past, you can click here, or maybe you might like any of these videos. I don't know, I'm not you. Find out. May you read your favorite books in 2023. Frog Snog out. <laughs>